Hi, I'm Stan Riddle with Viberline. Today we're going to talk about roughing in your shaft alignments. Now we'll be taking questions from you all today, so please submit your questions. We'll get to as many of them as possible during this webinar, and uh, I'll give you my word we're going to answer them all as best we can if they run over. We'll get to you afterward. We'll send you an email. You know, it doesn't matter what tool you're using to perform alignment. If you don't rough in, you can have errors in your alignment measurements, and your alignments may take longer, and here's why. Most alignments are done with a coupling made up primarily because it's easier and faster than taking it apart. But if you have gross misalignment, the forces on that made up coupling can actually influence the shaft positions again a little bit. If you had time to do all your alignments with the coupling apart, you know, roughing in really wouldn't be necessary, but most of us honestly don't have that luxury. So the reason to rough in is to reduce these forces and to minimize errors in the alignment measurements. So the purpose of roughing in really isn't about how accurately the lasers measure or how big or fast the detectors are. It's simply to limit those forces on the couplings and shafts so you can get an accurate measurement. Now you may think that skipping rough alignment would not leave that kind of forces in the coupling, but let me show you why you should believe it. First, we're going to take a measurement with a machine coupled, then we'll remove the insert and measure again uncoupled and compare the two. You may be surprised at what we find. So what we're going to do is we're going to perform an alignment on this pump without roughing in. Now you'll hear a lot of companies say, some companies say that uh, roughing in really isn't necessary, that you can do this without roughing in. But uh, we want to show you this morning that the roughing in is important regardless of the tool you're using, whether it's lasers, dials, or even a good old fashioned straight edge. So I want to show you the changes that can happen between alignment data that is coupled and alignment data that is uncoupled. So we're going to take this first set of measurements with our coupling in place and it should be obvious that we haven't roughed this in. We just stuck the motor up on the uh, sub base like a lot of companies do. We're just going to throw everything together and start aligning. So we'll take our measurements. When we finish these we're going to write them down up here on this whiteboard because we want to compare the two. Now I'm going to be trying to be very careful and we're not trying to cook the books on this at all. We want to take the same measurements from pretty much the same positions each time. So we're going to be measuring off 9, 12, and 3 just by eye. Now you don't have to do that since this laser is using the tri-point method we just need three measurements. But to increase our repeatability and consistency I want to make sure I take them in about the same place each and every time and be as careful as possible. So now we have our results. We're going to write these down up here on the board. So remember, this first measurement is coupled, but not roughed in. And we have an angularity of plus 7.5 per inch in the vertical, with an offset of minus 144.3. And our shim values at the feet are minus 80 on the inboard, and minus 28 on the outboard. That may seem excessive, but that's not uncommon on a machine just coming out from the factory. Horizontally, we actually got lucky. We have an angularity of minus 0.7 per inch, but we have an offset of plus 56 thousandths, 56.2. And our values at the feet are plus 50 on the inboard and plus 46 on the outboard. So now, Let's see what it looks like if we remove the coupling insert. So now what I've done is I've removed the coupling insert. I haven't moved the motor at all. I will tell you for honesty's sake that I did remove this M sensor bracket so I could separate the coupling, but I put the coupling back in the same place and I put the, uh, the transmitter detector back in the same place. I marked the shaft so that everything goes back where it goes. I've actually installed two dial indicator magnetic bases and I use these really as steady rest, just stops to hold the, uh, the brackets up to keep them from flopping around. We're going to take these same three measurements again, but this time with the coupling insert removed. And again, we want to try as carefully as possible 
being very cautious to make sure that we're using good, honest, valid numbers each time. Then I'm going to rotate again, and I have a steady rest using the dial indicator mag brackets on the other side. That's pretty close. So we'll take that third measurement, and what I'm going to do is write these down on the board and we'll compare the two. So there's our values with the machine uncoupled. So this time, uncoupled, we have a vertical angularity of plus 10.3 mils per inch. We have a vertical offset of minus 170.3. We have a horizontal angularity of minus 2.3 mils per inch. We have a horizontal offset of 71.9. Now, vertical foot values are minus 83 and minus 11 for the outboard. Horizontal foot values are plus 53 on the inboard and plus 37 on the outboard. So let's add these two together and see the difference in coupled and uncoupled values. Now our first one is we've got 7.5 coupled, 10.3 uncoupled, is a change of minus 2.8 mils per inch. Our vertical offset was 144.3 coupled, 170.3 uncoupled for a change of 26 mils, 26 thousandths of an inch. Vertical angularity was minus 0.7 coupled, minus 2.3 uncoupled for a change of minus 1.6 mils per inch. And our horizontal offset, 56.2 minus 71.9, gives us a net of minus 15.7 thousandths of an inch or mils. So we can see from this that there's quite a bit of difference in these values, whether this machine is coupled or uncoupled. Not because of changes in the laser, not because of inaccuracies in the heads of the software, or even the guy that's turning the thing around. The thing comes from this. Those differences are based on this coupling insert. If you think of this thing like a giant stiff rubber band, when we've got it in a lot of tension, it actually can deflect these shafts, causing them to bend slightly. So when we take the measurements, it looks different coupled than it does uncoupled. And that's why we perform pre-alignment steps. So we saw from our first test that when we do this coupled and uncoupled without the roughing in process, we can have big swings in our alignment values. So what I've done is I've aligned this machine uncoupled, uh, didn't put the coupling in, and I can assure you, no parlor tricks, we don't have to. Uh, it's a measurement tool, no different than a six inch ruler. So we've performed the alignment, and now we're going to take a final set of measurements uncoupled, and let's see how close we are. And again, I'm using the steady rest, the dial indicator mag bracket, so that I don't have to hold on to everything. Uh, most of you probably know that as you get these things closer to aligned, uh, coupled or uncoupled, uh, just the weight of the brackets is enough to uh, throw things around a little bit, and I don't want anything to bump. We want to make sure we do this accurately and going back to the same places each time as close as possible. So we're going to take our three measurements one more time. So now we have our alignment values and I'm going to write these up on the, on the uh, whiteboard again just so we can compare. Now again, this is the uncoupled values. And we have an angularity now of plus two ten thousandths per inch, an offset of minus 2.2 mils. Our foot values are zero and plus one. Horizontally, we have a new angularity of minus 0 0.1 or 1 ten thousandth of an inch per inch. And we have an offset of minus, whoops, minus 0 0.5. And our foot values are minus 1 and minus 1. So now what we're going to do is we're going to put the insert back in, take those same values, take same measurements again, and let's see 
how little these numbers change. So now we've put the coupling insert back in. We're going to take these three measurements one more time and let's see how much change happens between coupled and uncoupled measurements. And again, I'm going to take those same three measurements. I still have the steady rests in place. Of course, the whole coupling turns together now, but I am going to be mindful of backlash and make sure my angles match up pretty closely each time so we make sure we're putting in accurate measurements. And there's our final alignment values, and let's write them up on the board and we'll see how they compare. So now coupled, we have a vertical angularity of 0.3 thousandths per inch. We have a vertical offset of minus 2.6. We have a horizontal angularity of zero, and we have a horizontal offset of 0.1. So here's our change. You can see it here on the board. Between coupled and uncoupled, we changed one ten thousandth of an inch, or 0.1 mils, on our angularity. On our offset, we changed four ten thousandths of an inch, or 0.4 mils. Horizontally, on our angularity, we have a change of one ten thousandth of an inch, or 0.1 mils. And our change on our offset, coupled to uncoupled, is six ten thousandths, or 0.6 mils. So, we have repeatability here coupled or uncoupled to less than a half a thousandth of an inch. Now what that means is this, when we rough in by minimizing these forces and getting, getting things close before we start, we don't have to worry about any internal stresses into the bearings, we don't have to worry about any elasticity problems with this uh, coupling insert trying to bend the shafts and deflect their position, we can just rough it in to 10 or 15 mils or so do our alignment, and be confident that our numbers will be very repeatable. If I'd corrected it while coupled, it would have been off a bit, and I would have had to remeasure one or two more times to get it in. When we get in a hurry and we skip the roughing in process, the first alignment correction relieves the stresses, but it usually doesn't achieve a precise alignment. So we have to remeasure and recorrect one or two or three or more times. Not only that, but uh, if this coupling had been somewhat inflexible, uh, I could have caused damage to the seals or the bearings just by putting the coupling in strain and tension to assemble it. So how do you avoid a problem like this? Rough it in, and we want to show you some methods how to do that. So the roughing in process as it relates to alignment is very important. We're going to go over some different methods to do this. There are a lot of ways to rough in, a lot of ways to just scale off and measure this thing, and I want to go over some of those so that some of you have a better understanding. Some of these ways you may have never seen before. But honestly, this doesn't take a lot of high-tech stuff. You've probably got it already in your toolbox. The first method, and the one most people use, is the good old straight edge method. I'm simply just going to lay a straight edge across the top of this. Now, you'll notice that it wants to rock back and forth here, so you've got to locate off the one that's the highest. In this case, I'm resting on the pump side coupling, and if you can see, there's a gap right under there. I'll use this flashlight so it's a little easier to see. What I want to do is actually measure that. Now I've got a 50 thousandth shim, and when I slide it under here, I can feel it bump and lift that steel rule up. So 50 is too much. Here's 45, very close, within 5 thousandths of an inch, but it very snugly fits right under there. Now there's one other thing I want you to see here, and I'm going to try to hold my fingers and make all this work at once. Um, if what I have is actually, I can feel it almost drag in the front, but it's loose in the back, which tells me this, the back of this motor is lower than the front or the inboard. So right off the bat, we can tell there's a little bit of angularity. Now again, it's not that much, and it usually isn't that critical. In this case, what I want to do, if this 45 goes under just gently and doesn't touch, then I'm going to add 45 thousandths to each of these four motor feet and close that gap up and get these roughed in. So by roughing in vertically, we're going to close that gap up. And what you need to be mindful of 
is you, whenever possible, you always want to do your vertical first. Once we establish this vertical up and down or elevation on this motor, we can slide it back and forth as far as the motor bolts and the holes will let us go, and it won't change this very much. But if we got it in side to side perfectly and just were proud of ourselves, then went to here and found out we had to shim it, we're going to put a pry bar into this motor and pick it up, and when we do, it's going to move. It's going to change. So get your vertical right first, then work on your horizontal. And again, you want to get it to 10 or 15 mils or so. So now what I'm using is a filler gauge. Uh, you can use it the same as shims. As an old machinist, I'm a little more uh, drawn to using a filler gauge. So what I've got here are two blades, a 22 and a 23. That adds up to 45 thousandths. I'll wipe them clean, pull them together, and as I slide this under the coupling, I can tell that that is really, really close up and down. So our first shot that we decided we wanted to do with about 45 thousandths, I can check it here with this feeler gauge and find out that that's pretty close to what we need to raise it up. It's about 45 thousandths. You know, you might have thought that some laser tools require rough end because the detectors are too small. But with most modern day laser tools, quite honestly, that's just not the case. Uh, once again, roughing in is about minimizing those forces that can cause errors in alignment and make alignments take longer than they should. So if someone tells you you can skip the rough alignment, they simply don't know alignment. Um, to paraphrase a lawn care company commercial, it's not about how fast you align, it's how well you align fast. In our new book, The Alignment Field Guide, uh, there's a lot of case studies in here, a hundred or so, about alignment problems and solutions, such as one we're talking about today. And it's available on Amazon.com, and I hope you'll check it out. So we want to give you a moment now to submit your questions, give you a little information about our upcoming Realigning America tour, coming to a city near you. So please stay tuned, submit your questions, and we'll be right back. I'm David Stroyevsky. I'm the CEO of Vibroline Incorporated. Realigning America Tour is a seminar series to teach people about good shaft alignment principles, good shaft alignment concepts, and techniques. This year, it's all centered around real-life case studies that we've uncovered in factories just like yours. The Realigning America Tour will be in 19 cities in 13 states. It's absolutely free of charge, absolutely no sales content, if people will submit their questions when they register for the Realigning America Tour, we will be prepared to answer their questions at the seminar that they attend. I am so excited for the opportunity to interact with so many great people throughout the country. What a great opportunity. I hope you'll join us. So thanks for your questions. We appreciate it. Appreciate you joining us today. Let's try to get right into these and we'll answer as many as we can. Uh, Mark asks, what is the industry standard for acceptable misalignment? Uh, Mark, you said one mil, two mil. There really is, is to, at least to my knowledge, no industry standard. API has a spec. I think NASA has a spec. I'm sure the military has some specs. But uh, misalignment is, really doesn't have an industry standard. Um, it depends on a lot of things, type of couplings, speeds, shaft lengths, uh, hard start versus soft start, specific gravities of fluids pumped, and all those kinds of things. Uh, we just recommend that you check with your engineering department, and if not, certainly if you're using our tools, uh, they have uh, alignment tolerances built in, and I would use those. Uh, it says, if so, which type of misalignment is most forgiving? Um, it's a good question, and again, that depends. Uh, different couplings respond to misalignment differently. Some of them have very little tolerance for offset, but good angularity. Some have good angularity, uh, no offset. Some don't tolerate either very well. Uh, as long as you stick with a standard, such as ours or some of the other manufacturers, or even the coupling manufacturers, you'll probably be great with that. Uh, the question from Mark says, for correcting soft foot, Will any plastic shims work, or is there a specific plastic? Uh, I've used the plastic shims some, and they can compensate fairly well in some instances for soft foot. Uh, you can also use cut shims to uh, do a step shim if you need to. You know, we're not going to recommend one over the other because this is not a commercial enterprise for this webinar, but uh, the plastic shims can often help cover up some soft foot. Great question. 
Uh, is there a workaround for a small amount of runout? I assume you mean by coupling runout. Uh, if your coupling runout is small, quite honestly, if it's large, if you're using our lasers, the laser won't see it. Uh, but coupling runout can influence the vibration level. Uh, what I would recommend, we usually try to say that you want to keep your runout down to a couple mils or less, a couple thousandths. If it's a 3600 RPM coupling, I'd try to make sure runout was one or less. Uh, because as you increase the speed, you increase the forces. So just keep it as small as possible. Uh, Jose asked a question, what procedure could I use to detect misalignment with a data collector? I assume you mean a vibration data collector. That's a great question. Uh, actually working on a little presentation now about vibration and, and uh, misalignment and how they interact with each other. Here's the problem, Jose. Uh, misalignment can show up as 1x, 2x, 3x, 6x, a lot of different things. Uh, vibration is a good way to indicate the possibility of misalignment, but really the only way to detect and confirm it is by measuring the alignment. Uh, you can even, kind of old school, but we used to check phase across the coupling. You'd expect a 180 degree phase shift, but even with that, you really need to check the alignment to verify whether it's good or not. Uh, says, can your alignment align, can your equipment align vertical shafts? Absolutely. Uh, and it does it very well. Contact us a little more in time, take a little more time than we have on this webinar, but we can do vertical alignments and have done them. Uh, Roman says, what is the best way to get rid of or not chase the soft foot? Uh, great question. Chasing soft foot is a real pain. Uh, the way we recommend it is a two-step procedure to check for soft foot. One is with all the bolts loose, we just go around with a filler gauge or a shim to minimize the gaps underneath. Then we tighten the bolts down in a controlled repeatable pattern, a crisscross pattern. Then we loosen one bolt and we check that one foot individually because when you do that you isolate the other three feet and you only see that change. A lot of times if you're chasing a soft foot, moving it from one set of feet to the other set of feet, you're actually adding too much shim. You might want to drop that value down some and see if you can minimize it across all four feet. That's a great question and, and contact us if you need some more information on that. We'll be glad to help out. Uh, Tim says the laser we looked at says that Viberline tools can't measure much angularity. Why don't they? Tim, that's a good question and I'll uh, quite honestly, I'll call BS on that one. Uh, most Viberline tools use a 30 millimeter detector. It's over an inch. So it can measure even a severe angularity. Um, but you know, like we said earlier, it's not about the laser, it's not about the tool, it's about removing those unwanted forces and to really just allow the measurement tool to do its job, just to measure the alignment. So our tools can measure some pretty substantial angularity problems. Uh, to be honest, if, if you or anyone else has questions about how our lasers measure angularity, let us know. We'll be glad to get into more detail about it. We can got some specifics we can show you on measuring angularity. Carlos says, how close do I need to rough in? Uh, Carlos, we usually recommend 10 to 20 mils. Quite honestly, there's no magic number. Uh, me personally, I usually try to just get it close enough that I can't see the gap on top or on side to side as I'm roughing in, or at least get it very small. You don't want to spend all day roughing in. Really, well, you just want to take a few minutes, get it close so you relieve those stresses within the coupling and the shafts, and just uh, let your alignment tool do its job. So it looks like that's all the time we have for questions this morning. Again, I want to thank you for joining us. Uh, we appreciate your time and commitment to us. And uh, please stay tuned to us for more upcoming webinars. And again, this is Stan Riddle with Viberline. Have a great day.